And that's primarily so that um, those that can't attend tonight will upload it to the Winnipeg Humane Society's YouTube channel in the next day or so, so that more people can access the presentation. Um, everyone here tonight is welcome to have their cameras on if they so desire, you don't have to, but all mics are going to be muted for the presentation. It's really just to prevent any sort of um, background noise or disruptions from occurring throughout the presentation, um, but I highly um, suggest people utilize the chat feature. Um, feel free to introduce yourselves. Let us know where you're joining us from tonight. Um, have a conversation. Um, I do ask that any sort of questions that you might have throughout the presentation, if you can hold on to those until the question and answer period that will happen at the very end. Um, that way we don't have to go back through the chat and, and try and find um, different questions that people might have asked. So for the best opportunity of, of getting your question answered, um, try to save it to the end. That's my one suggestion. Um, but other than that, uh, we're gonna get ready to, to start the presentation now. So say hello, let us know where you're from, um, and let's get started. So again, thank you everyone for, for tuning in. Um, this presentation tonight is brought to you by the Winnipeg Humane Society's Animal Compassion Team, which is a group of committed community member volunteers who dedicate their free time um, to be with the Winnipeg Humane Society and advance all aspects of animal welfare. So um, pre-COVID, this committee of volunteers did a lot of educational campaign work. Um, they, they were out in the public eye talking about issues like gestation crates, exotic animal welfare, intensive confinement of animals. Um, since the pandemic hit, the committee has moved towards providing online virtual content. Um, so they do a monthly speaker series that, that sheds light on a variety of animal welfare issues, um, including horse exportation, which is what we're speaking about tonight. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about the Animal Compassion Team or other volunteer opportunities like this, um, let me know. I can provide my email address, my Winnipeg Humane Society email address in the chat, um, and we can get connected and, and get you to fill out an application to, to join the team. Um, the Winnipeg Humane Society is Manitoba's oldest animal welfare organization. In 2021, we're celebrating our 128th year of advocating for animals, which is absolutely incredible. Um, what many people probably don't realize, though, is that our organization's inaugural years of operation um, were really focused on, on livestock and, and animals like horses. They weren't focused so much on dogs and cats. Um, the humane treatment of horses was a key mission for our organization, and it wasn't really until the mid 20th century, 20th century that we saw that perception shift um, as more and more people started having domestic and companion dogs and cats in their homes and, and less um, horses that were dependent on for transportation and things like that. That's kind of when the focus of the organization shifted towards dogs and cats. But when we started out 128 years ago, we were on, we have archived uh, documents of the Humane Society advocating for, for horses to be treated humanely and, and for improving their welfare conditions, which I actually just find fascinating. Um, and then in the past year or so, partially thanks to the work of the Animal Compassion Team, we're bringing horse welfare back to the agenda of our organization. Um, and part of that includes making fellow Canadians aware of, of what's going on to, to horses throughout Canada and different ways that they're currently being exploited or treated. Um, and it's something that we're going to continue to use our platform uh, for, for addressing. And we're going to continue to form alliances like those we have tonight, um, our special guest speakers that will be talking about horse exportation tonight. Um, our voices are, are stronger when we're united. We're stronger when we advocate on this on these issues together. And that's exactly what Canada's horses need right now. So with all of that being said, this brings me to Jan Arden's portion of the presentation. Um, it was recorded earlier tonight. I'm going to share my screen now um, so that Jan can can share her heartfelt words for our supporters and and for all of 
all Canadians, really. So let me just do that right here and we'll get started. All right. Welcome and thank you everyone for attending tonight. Um, my name is Brittany Semenik. I am the Animal Welfare Consultant for the Winnipeg Humane Society. And joining me tonight is a very special guest who really needs no introduction. She is a multi-platinum award-winning singer, songwriter, author, actress, animal advocate, Canadian icon, Jan Arden. Jan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to the Winnipeg Humane Society tonight um, and our supporters. So thank you so much for, for being here. Well, right out of the gate, Brittany, I want to thank you so much because this whole campaign about banning live export, stopping live export uh, to Japan and Korea is about awareness. So thank you, Brittany. Thank you to the Winnipeg um, Humane Society. Um, your, your compassion for animals is what are going to change the world. And just you guys doing exactly things like this these kinds of gatherings of like-minded people because everyone really at the end of the day Brittany wants to know what they can do and that is my most frequently asked question um you know just just right out of the gate people 99% of them Brittany always say to me I had no idea this was happening and it's happening um at the James Armstrong International Airport right in Winnipeg you know, every three, four weeks, it depends on the availability of the horses. It's happening in YYC, which is the Calvary International Airport, and Edmonton. And and it's done in the middle of the night, like three, four o'clock in the morning. Um, anyway, I just, please ask away, because I think, I think people I, well, I think you make really want to know how to help. It's astonishing to me how people, um, like you mentioned, Winnipeggers here don't even know that it's happening in our very own backyard, and that... Um, the Winnipeg James Armstrong Richardson International Airport uh, plays a part in this industry and aids in the exportation of these horses. Um, and, and when people do find out, they're outraged. They're, they're astonished and they're, they're outraged. So, so just you lending your voice to this issue, you know, means so much more in bringing awareness to it. One thing that I've been wondering, and I'm sure, you know, many of our supporters are also wondering is, how did you even come to be aware of this issue and, and, and get involved in the first place. Dear friend of mine, my veterinarian for the last 25 years, our family vet, Judith Sampson French, remember that name? She's uh, an innovator. She's probably done 100,000 operations on every kind of pet imaginable. She uh, got me involved probably 14, 15 years ago with the Alberta Wild E. Cull, which is the wild horses that roam the, the eastern slopes in southern Alberta. And um, she told me about, you know, these, these guys that got together every spring and rounded up hundreds and hundreds of wild horses and basically sent them off to slaughter because they were a nuisance. Anyhow, I won't get into that. But because of my relationship with her there, horses suddenly became on my radar. I was raised in southern Alberta. I still live in the country. I was raised around horses. We had horses as a kid. Um, so when this came to my attention, probably oh gosh a year and a half ago i was like everybody else what the hell what are they doing large draft horses so imagine horses 17 hands high i'll give you an example if i'm five foot three if i were to stand next to a draft horse a budweiser horse big budweiser horses that pull the budweiser wagon that's how big these horses are that's what the japanese culinary market wants these horses are eaten as bashimi, which is raw sushi, raw meat. So they're very specific. That's why they want the horses alive. Anyway, very long story. Um, if I were to stand next to a draft horse, I would come up to its shoulder. Imagine now, if you will, folks, four of these horses, three or four horses, packed into a flimsy wooden crate. They're flimsy and wooden because they don't want to spend money on metal ones because it cuts into their profit margin which is about 20 to $25 million a year, depending on how many horses they can gather from auction sites, from their breeding programs um, to fly over there. Uh, they even have Japanese inspectors that come to the feedlots in Manitoba, in Alberta. They go around with a big chalk marker and they mark their asses on these horses like they are nothing. 
and the ones that are chosen for the Asian market, the Asian sushi market, off they go in those wooden crates. I've been on hundreds and hundreds of international flights over both oceans. Um, I'm well into my third million mile flying in the sky. 50 or 60 of those flights have been terrifying. You can drop five or 6,000 feet down into turbulence. It's not fatal to us passengers who have a pilot coming on saying, strap yourselves down, we're going to hit some stuff. But sometimes you don't even get noticed. So 5,000 feet in 20 seconds, four horses standing in a crate that aren't ever meant to be like that. They fall over on each other. There's often fatalities, grievous injuries. They're crapping on each other. They're peeing on each other. They're in these crates for almost two days. From the time they're loaded from the feedlots into the trucks, let's count, let's start the timer there. They get to the airports, whether it's you guys in Winnipeg or Calgary, Edmonton, they're loaded around seven o'clock at night into those crates. They're hit. I've, I've seen the loads three times. They're hit. They don't want to go. They make sounds that you will never, ever forget as long as you live getting into those crates. They are terrified. These are animals that were raised to trust us, to work for us to do our bidding. They fought in both world wars for us. We have to decide as Westerners, as Canadians, if we are horse people or we are horse murderers. It's as simple as that. This process stopped in the United States in 2006 because of public outrage awareness pressure. That company that did the live exporting moved up here to Canada. Yeah, and that so the don't lose percent. heart. Public, public pressure will make a difference. It will, your awareness, you sticking your hand in the air, telling your neighbor, going to the airports to see the loads, being aware of what's happening, writing your MLA, writing your government, um, just making noise. It's like someone standing outside your door and banging a pot and pan. Eventually, it just breaks them down. Absolutely. Uh, you recently, speaking of which, on January 21st, you were a part of the federal government's all parties animal welfare caucus discussing this very issue i was wondering if you could um tell our supporters a bit more about what that was like yeah it was it was a real privilege to be invited to speak to uh 52 senators actually uh 48 members of parliament led by uh, nathaniel erskine who's a huge animal advocate um and we spoke just like we are now, about what happens, why it happens, what the origin of where these horses come from, why it's a problem in this country. Um, and, and we really wanted to be very specific about splitting out live export from the domestic slaughter. Domestic slaughter is a big complicated beast. And I think the problems that we've had with the uh, Canadian Defence Horse Coalition, uh, Horse Defence Coalition, is that people are like, don't tell me what to eat. You know, you run into that stuff all the time. So we've really tried to split out the live exports, and that's what we did at the caucus. Everyone was on side. Everyone was like, this is a no-brainer. Everyone was saying we're so frustrated with, with uh, animal welfare laws in this country. We have some of the worst with the G7. Canada, mm -hmm. we always think, uh, Canadians sitting at home think, oh, we have such great welfare laws. We have no welfare laws. We have the worst travel laws, travel times, on the planet, on the planet. And we just don't do anything to protect horses. We don't do anything to protect cattle, chickens, anything. No. Nothing that we eat is protected. Okay. So that came up in the meeting, but the fact that they want to really pound the petition, they say petitions hold a great deal of importance with the legislature. So we want to make sure, I mean, in a perfect world, we'd love to have millions of signatures, and we think we can do that. Um, but it was a really, really positive meeting. Lots of great ideas. Elizabeth May was there, leader of the Green Party, or previous leader of the Green Party. Um, a lawyer talked about the legal aspects of this and how to pressure the government. Um, and they don't even know about it. <laughs> what really made me shake my head, Brittany, was most of the MPs like, Jan, we found out about this through the horseshit.ca campaign. And I know it sounds a little crude, but folks, we wanted to get people's attention. So the website www.horseshit.ca gives you access to write your members of parliament, buy a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, 100% of the proceeds go to help horses, 100%. And um, 
it just gives people a lot of information on how they can help with live export and what they can do because it's frustrating. You're sitting at home going, how can I help? Absolutely. And it's one of those things where, you know, here at the Winnipeg Canadian Society, it's something that we have been advocating against for years now. And, and like I mentioned before, I've yet to meet, meet someone who finds out about it and isn't instantly outraged. So in terms of next steps, anyone that isn't aware, definitely please check out the horseshit campaign that Jan has started here. Um, it's, it's something that, that I envision we can actually end, you know, in the next little while. Because we will. Oh, we will. Heartedly. Um, it's, it's right here in Winnipeg, and it enrages people, and it's, it's a huge campaign of the Winnipeg Humane Society. So um, from the bottom of my heart, I just want to thank you for, for taking this time to, to lend your voice to this issue because it can people like, like us that have been you know, on the front lines, I've been at night and I've witnessed the loading of these horses, and, and it's hard to not get beaten down sometimes where you feel like you're not really making an inch in the right direction. But... but um, you know, we, we will get it done. We're not going to stop, Brittany. People like you aren't going to stop. I'm not going to stop. No, absolutely and, not. And, and, um, we, we, we've made a lot of ground in the last 12 weeks. We've sold out of our t-shirts and sweatshirts three times. That's great. And we are now actively getting money into the hands of rescuers. We're getting money into the hands of people that are, are operating sanctuaries. These horses will find homes. And and further than that, you know, the breeding programs, they're very aware of that now, that these are specifically bred for uh, a, a feeding wealthy people an ocean away. It makes no sense for Canadians. It makes no sense for our environment. It makes no sense for the land in which we hold to be sacred and true. I mean, it, it, it just makes no sense on every level. So um, don't lose faith. Um, in order for things to change, you must bear witness. And you know that, you know that more than anybody um, because you have been to the loads and I have too and I continue, I'm gonna keep going because we can help horses and we will make change. It just has to be, cons it's like stopping something from bleeding. Steady, consistent, even pressure. You can't take your hand off or you lose all the ground. So we're not gonna take our hand off the wound. We're gonna keep plunging forward. Don't lose heart. Uh, there's young horses now that we, we can potentially save. There's, there's colts right now that are four weeks, six weeks, ten weeks old that we can potentially keep off of these 747s. So let's just keep our eye on the prize. Tell your friends. Tell people. T retweet me. Get out there. Retweet. Uh, quote my tweets. Uh, just whatever you can do. That stuff goes a long, long way. Well, there you have it. Public pressure will change the world. So, again, thank you so much, Jan Arden, for lending your voice to this cause. It is so important and so crucial that Canadians are aware of what's going on here. Um, and on behalf of the Winnipeg Human Society, again, thank you. thank you so much. Okay. Okay, incredible words from an incredible person. I, um, I, I had a few messages uh, during Jen Arden's presentation that people weren't able to, to join um, while the video was playing. So my heartfelt apologies on that for those that were trying to um, get access to the presentation and weren't able to while that was going on. Um, and for those that are watching this at a later date, um, again, we apologize for the technical difficulties. If you weren't able to, to join us live um, the way that we intended, I'm hoping that you can at least watch the uploaded video once we get it onto our YouTube channel. Um, it's just some of the technical difficulties that go along with doing things live. But I, um, I would like to continue on and, and introduce our next speaker. Um, in the presentation, who really also needs no introduction. Um, she's a fierce defender of animals and has done incredible work throughout Canada on their behalf. I am, of course, talking about Seneca Crossland. Uh, Seneca is president of the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition 
and a board member with the Animal Alliance of Canada. Her past involvement in animal issues includes working with Kelowna, BC city officials on exotic, on exotic animal bylaws, developing and implementing a feral urban rabbit rescue program, and procuring a regional district and community involvement for humane, non-lethal beaver management in area waterways. From 1997 to 2003, Seneca assisted with the rescue, rehabilitation, and adoption of hundreds of slaughter-bound horses, including foals from the pregnant mare urine or PMU industry. The launch of the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition followed in 2004 in response to a growing need for equine protection. The Canadian Horse Defense Coalition's goal is to end the practice of horse slaughter in Canada, as well as the exportation of live horses overseas for the same purpose. It has become a national effort, including political and legal initiatives and celebrity involvement. Please join me in welcoming Seneca Crossland. Thank you so much, Seneca, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you to the Humane Society as well, Winnipeg Humane Society, and thank you to all you wonderful participants who I hope to be able to uh, paint a picture for tonight uh, about what horse um, exports for slaughter is like. Um, and I'd like to uh, also thank Jan Arden, who's been a wonderful, wonderful advocate for the horses. Uh, she's correct when she says, you know, that the, the momentum has now started in the recent recent past that we tried from 2004 on we have yes we've made some headway we had media uh, interested in certain cases um, you know from time to time uh, we were able to uh, increase public awareness we did some polls and things like that and so my way of thinking is that we set the stage and then someone like Jan comes along and and really throws her heart and soul into this campaign and really, really good things start happening for the horses. And so I'd like to just give you an overview, first of all, on horses. And for those of you who know horses, you'll know what I'm talking about and you'll have lots of other stories that, that you can tell as well and could add to this. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with horses, well, I, I hope I can just paint a little picture for you uh, of what they're like. Um, we have two horses of our own and one of them, is a Welsh pony quarter horse cross by the name of Montana, and he's uh, 26 years old. And the other one is actually the face of slaughter when you think about it, um, and the face of the, the types of horses who are sent abroad for slaughter uh, in Japan. Uh, Misty is a uh, Percheron cross. Uh, she's a heavy horse. And she was rescued uh, as a part of the from the PMU industry uh, at three months of age. Uh, she is now 18 going on 19 years old. So that was quite a while ago that we picked her up. Um, and I just have to say that it's been, it's been a wonderful thing getting to know horses, um, getting to know Montana and Misty. And I can't imagine when I look at Misty, I wonder what goes through these horses' minds when they're going into the kill box, when they're being transported um, across an ocean for slaughter, you know, because I know what Misty is like and I love her to pieces. Um, a couple of things that I can tell you about her and about the sensitivity of horses. Um, once when I went, it was during the winter, I went out to feed my horses and I threw some um, hay into their, their trough for feeding. And I slipped on the ice. I fell, just boom, like a sack of potatoes down on the ground. And along comes Misty. She left the trough, came over to me, and I, as I was picking myself up off the ground, she sniffed me from stem to stern. She checked out my back to make sure that I was okay. Because for horses, I guess that's pretty important. You know, they, they don't like to fall. And she saw me fall. Um, the other thing that she's done that is this really also cute is when I let them out from their paddock into the pasture. She's done this numerous times where she goes out into the pasture and takes one nibble of, of grass, comes running back up to me where I'm standing in the paddock and looks at me and jumps up and down, goes up and down like a yo-yo bucking in front of me as if to say, come on, come on, mom, the grass is out here, you know. 
So what I learned is that horses, um, these horses made me a part of their herd. You know, I feel um, like, like I know them, they know me, um, and I cannot fathom what it's like to, to send them to slaughter. But the truth of the matter is I have watched hours and hours of slaughter video and I've had to have a punching pillow in my lap to watch this. If anyone is, is interested or are able to watch this kind of video just to see what I'm talking about, it is on our website, um, www.canadianhorsedefensecoalition.org. Uh, and it's under investigations. Um, and there you can see, there is no um, comparison between humane euthanasia by a veterinarian and slaughter of horses. I've seen both. I've had horses have died, my own horses have died um, at the hands of a, a veterinarian and it has been very peaceful. Um, when you, you watch video, um, witness the slaughter of horses, it is anything but peaceful. And I'd like to just touch, this it will be mostly about live exports um, for slaughter, but I'd like to touch just a little bit on the domestic slaughter as well, because there is a link. Um, the link being that the horses for live export are these days, according to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, are all purpose bred like cattle. They're, they're purpose bred for the industry. However, when their Japanese official comes out and handpicks the ones who are going to Japan, um, the, the, you know, there's, there's only some of them that go, the rest end up being slaughtered domestically. So that's, that's the key here, that uh, you know, some of those, many of those horses are actually going for slaughter on Canadian soil. So I'd like to, well, perhaps I should backtrack a little bit and just tell you about uh, Canadian Horse Defense Coalition and how we, how we started. Um, in 1994, I was with a group called TRAX, the Responsible Animal Care Society, and we um, ended up being involved in a rescue of horses in my neighborhood where I, where I used to live. And so after we got finished with that and the horses went into good homes, um, we felt that we should carry on um, doing something for animals. So, so an animal society developed. And in 1997, we became aware of the pregnant mare urine industry. Um, we um, started to become involved in foal rescues. Um, we actually rescued during a period of years um, hundreds of PMU foals. Many of them, we worked with other groups and many of them went south of the border to uh, at least a couple of organizations down there. We uh, adopted out uh, foals uh, locally um, in other to other provinces uh, as well. Uh, it, it was quite, uh, quite an event um, and it went on for a number of years that we did this. And my Misty is actually from one of those, those whole rescues. Um, so then after that, um, I started to focus um, more on horses themselves. I love all animals. I think all slaughter um, is horrible to, to think of for any animal, but I started to to focus on horses thinking that they are, if we look at dogs and cats, well, perhaps horses are humankind's third best friend. Um, maybe they're the link that will help us understand what slaughter is like for all kinds of other animal species. So in 2004, CHDC was formed. We became a nonprofit organization registered in British Columbia. And then, um, more recently, though, we switched to federal registration, uh, federally registered nonprofit uh, based out of Orangeville, Ontario. And as we got going, we thought, okay, well, how do Canadians feel about horses? And so we thought we'd do a poll. Uh, it was an Ipsos Reid poll. It was in 2004. And we found that 64% of the respondents uh, were in favor of banning or slaughter for human consumption. 64%, that's a good majority. That a poll was repeated, not the same poll, this was a Nanos poll and it was done by parliamentary group in June of uh, 2019. It showed 69% of respondents opposed. So we went from 64 to 69. Numbers climbing, people are becoming more aware uh, of the problems associated with horse slaughter. 
at whether it's here on Canadian soil or whether it's, it's abroad. Um, there's no humane way to slaughter a horse. As I mentioned, it's not humane euthanasia. Um, horses are a flight animal. They have long mobile necks. If you watch the, the footage, uh, they are trying to get away. They're trying to, they're rearing and they're slipping, um, falling. Um, they are absolutely agitated. And if you know the nature of horses, they are so sensitive that they, they recognize danger and they are totally afraid in the kill box. They also, they have not been raised as livestock animals. So drugs go into, into horses. Um, drugs like phenylbutazone and clenbuterol. Um, my horses would never be eligible for slaughter um, and human consumption because they have had those prohibited drugs. Uh, and it, those are drugs that they don't have any uh, determined withdrawal times for. So uh, they don't know when the drug gets out of the system. And so therefore they are uh, prohibited to from going into the food chain. Um, public perception uh, has really increased over the past few years. Um, celebrities like Jan Arden just in the recent past have greatly magnified that. Um, we've done, as I mentioned, the polls, uh, petitions, everything like that to gauge how, how people perceive horse slaughter. And so just a little tiny bit more on domestic slaughter. There are two equine slaughterhouses owned by the same family. Um, and one of these slaughterhouses is in Alberta and the other one is in Quebec. Excuse me, well, I just have a little drink. Mm. Um, horses from <clears throat> come from random directions, uh, including the United States, to go uh, for slaughter in, in these slaughterhouses. Um, they, and when the meat uh, is shipped to the European Union, the horses have to be first quarantined for six months. You may have heard about this. Whereas non-EU countries, um, they, it's okay to slaughter them right away without that period of time. Um, they can come from the United States in a sealed load and go straight for slaughter. There is uh, something called an equine information document, which is, follows the horse uh, from auction feedlot to slaughter. And that's supposed to be like a history of the horse, a health history, as well as a history of, of drugs that the horses have received. The CFIA does random testing on, on horses uh, to see whether they have any horse or, or any prohibited drugs in them. The, a rate of testing is less than 1%, so a very small smattering uh, is done um, and isn't really a very good representation. There have been recalls issued from the Europe end, from Brussels, uh, recalls of horse meat because they found prohibited drugs at that end. So then about live exports. So I mentioned that these are all purpose bred um, according to the CFIA. Um, they're mainly sent to Japan. Uh, they can also be shipped to South Korea. Uh, Japanese individuals come to uh, hand pick them. And as I mentioned, the rest go to, to slaughter up blueberries. And we've actually found that draft horses, these big horses are hard to find. There, people have approached me saying, where can I get a draft? I'd like to, I'd like to rescue one. Well, just try and find one. They, they disappear into the pipeline these days. And when we send horses overseas for slaughter, all control is lost. It's bad enough at this end when we view the, the video footage of uh, slaughterhouses, what happens in Canada. We have no control over what happens in Japan or South Korea. Uh, we just send them over there and that's it. Um, Drafts for live export would not be given uh, drugs like but or phenylbutazone for pain um, because they are going for going for food, and not that feedlot horses get you know much veterinary care or farrier care at all. Um, you know they're basically there and being held for one purpose. 
So the problems with shipment, shipping them across, and Jan painted a, a really good picture of what it's like for the horses in these wooden crates. 28 hours now without food, water, and rest. And it's down from 36 hours, which sounds great on the surface, but still 28 hours. How would we like to be 28 hours in a crate with no food, water, or rest? Um, horses have died over the years, or, the, or they've been injured. There have been broken crates. We, a lot of our information we get through access to information documents, and this is this is where we get a lot of our data. And we've seen um, one case where a horse kicked right through a crate, um, damaged the fuselage of the, the plane. Um, in this case, the horses they ended up uh, being um, handled in, in Anchorage, Alaska. So the plane flew from Calgary to, to Anchorage and had to be there for quite a few hours. And those horses went 39 hours, all told without food and water. But that didn't even include um, the, the trip from uh, the feedlot to the Calgary airport and um, other, like when they arrive in Japan from um, from the airport to um, the feedlot in Japan. So that would still be on top of it. There, as you may have heard, we are suing the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for the way that they transport horses. Um, unfortunately, we lost uh, the first round um, in federal court. We feel that the judge did dismiss our application for judicial review. Uh, he more or less felt that we shouldn't be telling the CFIA how to do their jobs. Um, and that's not what we were asking. Uh, what we were asking is that the very meager protections that are there for the horses in the first place should be followed, that the government is not above the law. And the two sections that uh, were being violated, section 142 on head clearance, that horses, um, should not, uh, their their heads should not come in contact with uh, the top of the crate. And section 141.8.8, uh, segregation, horses over 14 hands high should be crated separately, not together. And when you can imagine these huge horses, uh, three to four per crate, um, and, you know, every now and again, you'll see ears poking through the top, top of the crate. Um, so when we noticed this, uh, it was brought to our attention back in 2012. Um, we were following it, we were gathering lots of information um, about what happens and we decided to uh, go to a lawyer about it. And th really the crates, when you think about it, the size of the crates, they're smaller than a standard one horse stall and they're, they're putting these horses into those crates. And there is no comparison how, between how sport horses are shipped compared to how the drafts are shipped for slaughter. The sport horses, they have a groom going with them. They have, get food and, and water and if they want to lie down, there's room to do that. Um, the draft horses, because they're going for meat, uh, they're handled in a totally different and tragic way. There were changes to the transport regulations which uh, came into effect um, in February uh, 2020. And they, so the trans, the time um, for, in, like for food, water and rest, that the, the time was uh, 36 hours it used to be, they couldn't go without food, water and rest. Um, but and they dropped that down to 28 hours, which I've mentioned. Um, also, they manipulated the regulations uh, so that now multiple draft horses can travel together because they feel that they're happier that way, that they, they somehow think that they are socialized in the feedlot uh, where they come from, that they know each other. But these feedlots can house thousands of horses and how they can possibly pick out the ones that get along together that are buddies, um, that's, that's really beyond me. Um, also, 
what they changed is that they the netting that covers the crate um, they said that it's not a part of the overhead structure and that the ears are allowed to occasionally poke through because the netting is not a part of the overhead structure but if you think of the crate you've got the the slats the wooden slats going across the netting covers it of course it's a part of the the structure if they if the ears breach the the netting they're also breaching the the overhead structure of the crate so these are the excuses that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uses uh, to be able to get away with the industry. They want the show to go on. Um, they cater to industry. Um, you know, they don't care that Canada is a, an OIE member. And OIE stands for the World Organization for Animal Health. And they basically set the standards for, for how um, animals are to be treated um, in, in travel and so on. And so what Canada is doing is against those standards. Hawaii is, is a member country, but yet we're, we're doing something that uh, is not in their rulings. So we, I thought about ways that we um, can reach our goals. And we've talked about public awareness. We've talked about um, media and celebrity involvement, uh, petitions, uh, polls, and, and publicizing. Um, petitions, um, there will be an upcoming um, e-petition, like a parliamentary e-petition, and a member of parliament will be sponsoring that. We will be um, publicizing that as soon as, as soon as we have it. Uh, right now, there on our website, there are some older petitions there. Feel free to sign them um, uh, because they're, you know, they're valid, um, and the more the merrier. Um, and in the meantime, but uh, you know, just know that this other petition uh, is coming up, and hopefully, will be up there soon. And we have our political campaign approaching members of, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> approaching members of parliament, um, making the agriculture minister aware of, of what's going on. We're working with um, some well-organized European groups um, who are in touch with politicians over there. We hope to get politicians here talking with politicians over there. Um, there are, there's a possibility of another private members bill. Um, back a number of years ago, there was a wonderful member of parliament, uh, Alex Adamanenko, and he put forward three separate bills to ban horse slaughter in Canada. One of them made it to second reading and unfortunately was, was voted down. Um, then it wasn't that um, far apart though. It was, let's see, 102 votes in favor and 155 against. So not really that far far apart. At the time, the interesting thing was the Liberals were totally in favor of that bill. They, the whole party was, was for the bill, um, supported it. Um, most of the NDP were, and it was the Conservative uh, members who basically voted the bill down at the time. So uh, it remains to be seen if there can be another uh, private members bill that can be, can be launched. There's our legal initiative, which I've talked about, and the appeal, we are appealing it, um, and we're waiting for an appeal date. Um, hopefully that'll be coming up by, by mid this year. Um, so then ways that people can help, um, go to our website, CanadianHorseDefenseCoalition.org, and Jan's website, horseshit.ca. There, um, you can find actions you can take, you can donate, you can buy items on Jan's site, um, which contribute um, to the protection of horses. Um, please, please engage your member of parliament. With our political campaign that we have going right now, it's crucial that the more MPs know and can be got on side, um, the better. Um, this is the time to do it. If you haven't spoken with your MP, if you haven't written an email, um, sent a hard copy letter, phone the office, whatever you want to do, um, please do so now. Uh, it's very, very important because the campaign is escalating. Um, we'll be talking about this more and more. 
if you love to write, write letters to your the editor of your local paper. Let them know what's happening. Increase public awareness. On our uh, website, um, we have uh, had brochures on there that you can print out and and hand and hand out to people. Um, as I mentioned, the petitions to sign. Our I have to apologize that our website is has been under renovation. So um, there are some links that aren't working right now, but we hope to get everything up and functional soon. Just, just keep checking back. Um, so those are, are basically the main points. And I, I hope I've been able to paint that picture for you um, about horses um, and how wonderful they are as animals and what are we doing to them? What are we doing? Thanks so much, Brittany. Well, thank you so much, Seneca, for, for the work that you do and the work that the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition does. It's so critically important and, and, and spreading the, the message to get uh, more public awareness on this issue is so important. Um, if anyone um, currently here in the chat has questions for Seneca or has questions on horse exportation in general or the ways that, that they can get involved to try and make a difference. Now is the time to, to enter your questions in the chat. Um, I have been monitoring the chat and I will, um, I will ask some questions as they pop up. One question that, that I saw Seneca that I'm curious to know about is, um, do we currently have any Canadian government officials that are on the advocacy side that we can work with that can help kind of be advocates against this industry and, and how do we get more officials you know on our side regarding this issue uh, by officials um i'm assuming like members of parliament uh is this is this what the question is um if so there are quite a number of uh, members of parliament at this time um who are interested um MP Nathaniel Erskine Smith is a wonderful um, advocate for animals. I know he's taken on some causes and he is intensely interested in this issue. Um, so we're hoping to hear lots more from him. Elizabeth May was on that Zoom call, um, very interested. And there were a number of others as well. Um, I was hoping to get a list uh, of everyone who had attended. I'm still hoping to be able to get that and I was, Seriously, writing down names as, as I was on the Zoom call um, to try to figure out who, who was interested. Um, but it was great to see the, the, the attendance and the interest. Um, another question that we had pop up in the chat um, or a, a variant of that question is, is there any way or have we looked into utilizing um, Japanese celebrities that would be willing to speak out against the, this issue um, from Japan side of things. Now, that's a that's a good question. Um, we don't know any Japanese celebrities um, that that would be worth looking into. We have had a couple of contacts in Japan. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been any recent contact. We haven't been able to um, a touch base with them. So we need somebody over there at that end. If if anyone knows, if anybody on this uh, call knows or has any contacts in Japan that we could work with and perhaps get us in touch with a Japanese celebrity, I'm all ears. That's great to know. Yeah, if anyone has <laughs> those contacts, please pass them along. Um, some more questions popping up in the chat now. Um, is there any sort of time frame for when you expect to head into the next level uh, of court or the next um, caucus meeting to address this issue? Um, so the, the caucus meeting um, would be uh, the political initiative. So we are waiting to hear back from um, Nathaniel Erskine Smith uh, to see what the next steps are basically now. And um, as far as the court goes, I'm assuming, meaning the appeal, um, we're waiting to hear about a date. And uh, that's all the paperwork has been submitted. Uh, it's in. We're just waiting to hear. Uh, and we're hoping by about mid, mid this year, perhaps. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, yes. I'm, I know I'm definitely going to be watching closely on that. 
Um, here's a question from Danica and Sherry. Hello, my, I am 11 years old. What can I do to help end the issue of horse slaughter? Danica and Sherry, thank you so much for, for being on the call. Um, that's wonderful. Um, talk to everyone you can. Um, you'll have friends who are interested in the issue as well. They'll be talking to their parents. Um, it's possible for, for you to just really build some momentum here and get uh, people involved and talking to their members of parliament about this issue. And yeah, and if you want to write letters to the editor uh, of your papers, just um, educate them. And I, I commend you for, for your interest and the work that you're doing to help out with this issue. Uh, we'll just jump to a couple more questions here. Again, I apologize if we don't get to all the questions tonight. Um, but another question is, what are the main airlines that that are exporting these horses and and that should kind of be targeted on the with these campaigns okay um right now it's it's basically the ones we've we've seen and, and monitored it's korean air um in the past it has been atlas air and nippon air cargo as well but we haven't seen flights from those two carriers for some time yeah, good to know. Definitely good to know. Um, do you have any for information on on how um, new ag gag laws that are being passed in a few different provinces, how that's going to be affecting um, the fight against horse exportation? Yeah, um, so Alberta, I believe, um, ha is one of those provinces, and that's where we monitor um, the horse exports, but uh, there's also in Manitoba, um, there are shipments from, from uh, Winnipeg. Um, so I'm not sure what the ag gag situation is in Manitoba, but I know that Alberta, yes, it is a reality. Um, so far, we haven't uh, worried too much about it because when people go out and monitor, they take video footage and pictures and so on, um, they're on, on the public property. So they're not going on to private property to do this. And sometimes police officers will come up and uh, just, you know, warn them that they have to stay back or whatever. But there have been no altercations or anything with the police officers. They seem to be very kind and and respectful of uh, public protest. Do you have any insight as to how this industry and horse slaughter in general was, was banned in the USA to begin with? How did they come to banning these practices? Yes, um, so the way it happened there is that um, the, they have um, funding, you know, federal fund, funding to inspect um, slaughterhouses. So that funding was ended for equine slaughterhouses. So that's basically how they, they ended it there. And there was a lot of um, celebrity action, um, people protesting and that kind of thing in the United States, much as you know what's happening now, you know, with uh, celebrity involvement and, and public protests and that kind of thing. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, what has the response been from the mainstream media in recent years on this issue? In recent years, um, we've got uh, interest um, over the years, um, but nothing as big as recently when Jan had <laughs> joined the battle. Um, there's been just a huge tidal wave of, of media interest. Yeah, and uh, all the power to her for lending her voice to, to this issue. Yeah, um, does, the, does the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition know what even happens to these horses once they arrive in Japan? Do you have anyone documenting the conditions in Japan at this point? No, uh, we don't know what happens to them. As I mentioned, um, you know, we, we're, they're at the mercy of the, the laws and or lack of uh, over there. We don't know what happens um, at that end. 
Uh, we do get some reports back um, from the Japanese officials at that end. So, which is how we find out about deaths and injuries and such. And we've been able to pull information through access to information on those kinds of situations, but they're under no obligation to provide any information from the Japan end. Yeah, okay, good to know. Um, another question popping up in the chat here. Um, is work being done to get the three main airports to, to stop allowing this activity to take place at those airports? We've written to uh, airport officials and it has really gone nowhere. Um, they um, basically have put us on ignore. Um, this would probably be a good campaign uh, if people were, were wanting to, to do that, uh, to protest at the airports. And um, of course, you know, Jan has been doing that in the Calgary airport. Um, it wouldn't uh, hurt to have that happening in, in Edmonton and Winnipeg as well. And just to, to make the airports, uh, make them realize that there is, is a problem with this, uh, you know, it's not, um, the public doesn't agree with what's going on. Um, people care about horses, animals matter. Um, they should stop this, it shouldn't be a part of it. Absolutely, and I know, you know, speaking as a fellow Winnipegger, the, um, the fact that our airport is still exporting horses during a global pandemic just blows my mind. And that's one of the, the questions and some of the comments in the chat, you know, how has the pandemic affected this industry? And from, from what I've noticed, it hasn't affected it at all. They're still exporting the horses, but I don't know if you have any further um, information on, on, on what's been happening. Yeah, they, they still are exporting the horses. Um, it's, it's hard to believe, uh, you know, uh, that, that it would be happening, but uh, there's been no major stoppage because of the pandemic. Yeah, it, it blows my mind. Um, another really good question from the chat is, where are all these horses that are per supposedly bred for slaughter, where are they coming from? Where are they breeding them? Yeah, this we don't know for sure. Um, what we have is our lists of um, that we've got from access to information, a list of um, what, what's called charters, and they can also be called consigners or exporters. And so we have some names, um, and we've noticed that um, some of those, uh, the names that come up, some of the, you know, they have their, their certain brands, you know, that they put on horses. And some of the brands on those horses have been seen in Kumamoto, Japan. So we have an idea that, that some of these um, charters are also breeding horses, but we don't have any definitive proof as to who is doing what. Wow, it's what an incredibly sneaky um, and, and lucrative industry. And, and I feel like for the longest time they, they've gotten away with you know, the average Canadian not even knowing that this is happening, but, but people are starting to take notice now. Um, I guess my own question for you, Seneca, is what do you, what do you predict for 2021? Are there, are there some big things coming down the pipeline now that Jan Arden has joined the campaign? Do you, do you feel like things are starting, starting to, to accelerate and gain momentum here? Uh, I'm just curious to know your, your thoughts on how things are progressing. Yes, um, there are things coming down the pipeline. I, we've talked about the, the political interest now, um, and hopefully we'll see something, something coming up very soon in the future on that. Um, media interest, um, we've been approached by documentary makers. Um, there is a W5 program coming up um, quite soon, um, which watch for that. It should be in February, um, and that's, that's uh, on this industry. Um, and I've been approached by other, um, another documentary maker as well. So, so there are things, uh, Jan Arden has been on, uh, for instance, the Linda Steele show, um, a couple of times now. There is lots of media interest, which really helps, uh, yeah. to get the word out there. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And it's, it's about time as well. It, it sounds like the main takeaway here is, for those wanting to get involved, it's crucial to keep 
lobbying your your MPs and and writing to your MPs and writing to the Minister of Agriculture demanding that this practice be stopped um, in the um, event page for tonight's presentation, we're going to have the links to all of the petitions, the, the link to the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition website, um, the link to Jan Arden's Horseshit uh, campaign. So keep checking the event page for all of those links. Um, are there any, um, and uh, as Seneca mentioned, there's going to be a W5 investigation on the horse exportation industry, which is only going to um, gain momentum in the advocacy department of this. So I feel like 2021 is kind of the year to put an end to horse exportation one and for all. Um, and it's great to see so many people caring about this issue and so many people interested in this event tonight that are wanting to get involved and are wanting to, to help Canada's horses. And that's very, um, that, that's so very, you know, heartwarming to see and encouraging to see. And I'm wondering if you have um, any last words on, on where we're at at this point with um, the way things are going? I'm feeling very, very optimistic that, that we've turned a corner. Um, as I said, we CHDC working all these years on getting everything together. We've maybe set the stage. And now we have people like Jan Arden um, who have uh, who is a main player there and uh, we're so grateful and we're grateful to, to people who are on this call tonight uh, for your interest in the issue. Um, animals matter, horses matter. We have a voice. Let's work on this together. Well, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the Winnipeg Humane Society, thank you so much, Seneca, for not only joining us for night, not only for joining us tonight, but for being there from the very beginning to advocate for these horses and, and to bring awareness to millions of Canadians. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, to everyone watching and tuning in tonight, again, thank you so much for, for spending your evening with us and, and caring about this issue. Um, my wholehearted apologies again for, for us reaching our maximum capacity for Zoom. It was not expected and it was also um, not, it was, we thought we were going to be able to have a much higher capacity. So for those that wanted to attend and weren't able to get on, I, I'm so sorry for that. Please look for the video tomorrow. You can watch it and, and still get so much, you know, critical information from this. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and have a good night, everyone. Take care. Thanks.